Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that your spirit might be working in our minds to illumine to us the truth that you would have for us from this very familiar but very sober parable that our Lord shared with the religious people of his day. We ask that you will use it to encourage our hearts, convict our hearts where need be, but most of all, use it to help us to love our Lord and Savior even more. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. In the book, A World of Atheism, sociologists have estimated that there are in the neighborhood of 500 to 750 million atheists or agnostics in the world. Most of them reside in China, in Russia, in the Nordic countries, and then scattered throughout the rest of the world. But together they represent approximately 7% of the world's population. I think most religious people live under the impression that atheists and agnostics, those who don't believe that God exists or those who don't know that he can be known for sure, are the only people that will end up in hell when they die. The assumption being that those who do believe in God, the religious people, that they will all be in heaven. And yet... There are 1.1 billion Catholics in the world. There's another 1.2 billion Christians that could be classified as Christians, but not Catholics. There are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. There are 1.1 billion Hindus. And there are another billion that make up the various other Eastern religions. What's rather interesting, as I was kind of reading all this this week, the I found that the Muslims, the Catholics, the Christians, and the Jews, even the Baha'i faith, they all all tie their faith in some way back to Abraham. And all those statistics tell us that there are over 90% of the world believes in some God, and over 50% of those religious people, over 4 billion religious people, See, Abraham is a key figure in their religion. Now, I say all that just to help you understand that the vast majority of people in the world are religious people. So when we think about heaven, when we think about hell, and when we think about the people that will be in hell, we need to understand that there will be a far greater number surprised religious people there than there will be those who simply don't believe there is a God. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, Jesus is giving us a parable that demonstrates that very thing. That you can be very religious and yet still wind up in hell if you reject the only way of salvation that He's clearly given us in Scripture. The parable here is a familiar one. It's about the rich man and Lazarus. And what's interesting here is that he's sharing this story with the religious rulers of his day. Religious rulers that hate him, that are plotting to kill him, and yet Jesus with great compassion is warning them, is warning these religious people to flee from the wrath to come. So I entitled this a a compassionate warning. A compassionate warning. This was not only Jesus' heart for the lost, but this should be those who are in Christ. That should be our heart as well, right? I'm not sure we think about hell near enough. If we did, I think we would all be much more motivated to reach out to others who are headed that way and warn them and direct them towards Christ. I think we would be greater fools for Christ trying to help people see their sin trying to help people know God's mercy in sending Christ to die for our sins, that they might be forgiven and saved 
from the eternal wrath of God. Jesus does that here for his enemies, for those who were even trying to kill him. He warns those who are lost in religious error, those who are lost in religious deception. He's full of compassion for his enemies, and so he warns them here through this very simple story. It's a story about a rich man and a poor man. A rich man who had a very, very good life, and a poor man who is destitute, who He's got it really bad in this life. They both die. The poor man goes to heaven. The rich man goes to hell. But the focus here isn't on the poor man in heaven. Rather, the story revolves around the rich man who finds himself being tormented in hell. This is about his experience. It's about his surprising end and his desperate attempt to warn his brothers who are still alive so that they will not end up in that place of torment with him. His end was one that he didn't expect because he was a religious person. The story, of course, as we know, is directed to the Pharisees, these religious rulers. They're the audience that Jesus is directing this to. These guys could never have imagined that they would end up in hell. They believed they were good people. They believed they were doing good things. They went to synagogue every week. In fact, they led the synagogue many times. They read the scriptures. They prayed. They gave of their tithes and offerings. They fasted. These guys are doing it all, the most religious of all the Jews. But as we know, it was all external. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 5, they do, referring to these Pharisees, they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. Internally, they didn't love God at all, nor did they love anyone else, which would be a fruit of their love for God. What they did love was money. In fact, remember, they were exposed as lovers of money back in verse 14. They loved their comforts, they loved their fine clothes, they loved their feasts, they loved their money and all that it could do for them, not what it could do for the kingdom of God, not what it could do for others, but what it could do for them. Remember, Jesus called them robbers in Luke eleven thirty nine. 39. They didn't care for the needy. They, in fact, they stole from them. In fact, over in Mark chapter 7, it tells us they even stole from their elderly parents. They were using their religion to make themselves rich and to massage their conscience, I guess if, even if they had one at all, they twisted their doctrine. They believed their wealth was a sign that God's favor was upon them and that those who were poor and needy were the ones who were actually cursed of God. Now, obviously, Jesus knows all that. He's been rebuking them for their greed. He's been rebuking them for their love of money. He's been rebuking them all along throughout his ministry. But that doesn't mean he's without compassion for them. And so he's extending a compassionate warning to them, again, to repent through this very vivid story about the rich man and Lazarus. Now, let me just mention one thing before we kind of jump into this this story, this is a story. This is a parable. These aren't real people. This Lazarus isn't the Lazarus that we find in in the Gospel of John who lives in Bethany. This is a parable that makes a point. These are made up people. So this isn't a story to, or I should say you should be very careful about using this story to build your eschatology from. People are in hell. They, They will be in hell. But those people aren't going to be able to see heaven, much less talk to someone in heaven when they're there. But Jesus sets the story up this way in order to teach a lesson, in order to make a point to these Pharisees. Now, as you see in your outline, we're going to divide this parable up into three sections. I've entitled it, The Here and Now, the the, the life that they're living, the life that we're living at this time, the here and now, the hereafter when they die and and go to their respective places, and then the please hear me, the, the please to listen to them and then Christ for them to listen to him. 
So let's listen to this story here. It starts in the, with the here and now. Jesus introduces to us a rich man in verse 19. He says, now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. This isn't just any rich man. This, is a, this isn't just your average wealthy man. This is a, an exceedingly wealthy man. And we know that because it says here he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, not just for special occasions, not just as a little event to go to, but daily he dressed in purple and in linen. That was his normal attire. I mean, you go into the, his closet and you look and it would be filled with the finest clothes the world had to offer. And he wore them every day. Purple and fine linen. Very, very costly clothes. In fact, making purple dye was a very, very expensive process. It's, it was made back then from shellfish, um, from sea snails, and they had to be collected by the thousands and put in this, this massive vat where you would begin boiling all of that, which would release the coloring. It was an incredibly expensive and labor-intensive process, and so this purple it was, was very, very expensive. Any garment dyed in this would be, would be very expensive. And it really became the color for the rich. And we kind of recognize that today, don't we? That's, how, that, that's the color of royalty. It has been throughout the ages. They were the only ones who could afford it. That's the issue. And so this man has a, a closet full of purple but also linen. Now, linen was kind of on the same par of purple in that it was very expensive to make. It was made by the Egyptians originally out of wild flax plants. And so the flax plants had to grow. They had to, they had to, then they had to be put through a process and add to that the skill that was needed for the people to be able to weave these fibers together. It was a very slow process. And again, just like extracting the purple the color purple from the shellfish, these, these two was a very, very time and labor intensive. And so it was very, very expensive. Not everyone could afford it. Not everyone could afford purple. Not everyone could afford linen. In fact, very, very few could. In fact, it was the only material that Egyptians would use for their priestly robes. It was, this was kingly stuff. It was worn by the, the, the highest elites, the most wealthy of people. And in death, it was even used for their burial shrouds for just those extremely privileged few who could afford it. So this guy's closet would have been something to see, filled with purple clothes, purple robes. It was filled with white linen, linen garments, tunics. All that was his daily attire. So this just wasn't a rich man. This was a filthy rich man. And he enjoyed living in it and showing off his splendor of his wealth, strutting himself around daily like a peacock. Jesus says this guy was joyously living in splendor every day. He lived in the pleasures of being surrounded by absolute luxury. Everywhere you looked, it was a pleasure to the eye. The smells around him brought pleasure to the senses, the food, pleasure to the palate, anything his heart desired. It was there for his asking. His days and nights were nothing but joy because everything around him was so beautiful. The people, the clothes, he lived in splendor every day, day after day. Now, at this point, the Pharisees would have been probably very impressed with this guy. This is what they were all about. Remember, they were lovers of money. They loved to be those who, were, who gained approval from others. They enjoyed their fine robes, their luxuries, the approval that they got from everyone who ooed and awed over them as they strutted themselves through the marketplaces. So this guy would, would have fit right into their world. In fact, they would have assumed that this guy was someone who had God's favor. Because, again, that was part of their theology. They believed that riches were a sign of God's favor. If someone had wealth, obviously they had been blessed by God. Remember, that's the same theology that some of Job's friends had. 
Eliphaz over and over told Job that God had taken away his immense wealth because of some sin. And so he charged him with sinning, saying he, he's, he's just giving what you, you, what you deserve. He says in chapter 22, yield now, confess your sin, and be at peace with him, and thereby good will come to you. He took, he took it from you because you've sinned. Now confess your sin, Job, and God will return your wealth. Wealth was a sign of God's favor in their theology. And that was the theology of the Pharisees. They saw their own wealth as a sign of favor from God. So, so they would have liked this guy. They would have liked this story so far. But then Jesus introduces another man in verse 20. In contrast to the rich man who had life, a life of joy, a life of splendor, verse 20 introduces us to a poor man named Lazarus. Lazarus. In contrast to the rich man who you notice had no name. This man has a name. In the Greek, it's Lazarus. In the Hebrew, it was Eleazar, which means God has helped. God has helped. And that tells us something about where this poor man had placed his trust, had placed his hope. It was, it was in God. This poor man had nothing to trust but God. From this description, we see that he had no money, he had no health, he had nothing. It says he was laid at the rich man's gate. The Greek term here for laid is, is balo, which means to cast or to throw. And, and it's passive, which means this guy just didn't walk up there and sit down to beg at a rich man's gate. Rather, he was dropped off there by someone, maybe even dumped there. But the word implies that he was crippled, that he couldn't walk. He, he, so, so he's not in good health. In fact, it, it says that he was covered with sores, literally ulcers, pus oozing out of his, of his flesh, open wounds caused by who knows what. I mean, maybe a disease, maybe infected wounds that were unable to be treated. He was covered with them. He was suffering. He was obviously need in, uh, in need of help and with no one to help him. Not only is his health bad, but he's hungry. Verse 21 says, in longing to be fed with the crumbs which are falling from the rich man's table. I mean, the rich man had plenty, plenty, so much. He, it was just brushed off the table and the household pets, whatever they were, they would just come up and eat from under the table. There was plenty of even crumbs for him. And he longed for those things. He was longing for the crumbs. I mean, so this is a starving man. But to make things even worse, Jesus says, besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. The only ones giving Lazarus any attention at all, maybe some sort of relief from the pain of the sores, are these dogs that were coming up licking him. And these dogs, they, they aren't your... They aren't like Arrow over here. They, they aren't your household pets. These are nasty scavengers. These are mongrels. They, they found open flesh. And this poor guy probably didn't have the strength to shoo him off or might have not had any feelings in his legs where these sores were and to know what was even happening. So he's surrounded here by dogs, dogs, plural. Plural, he's surrounded by these mongrels licking and probably chewing on the exposed flesh. I mean, this, this would have been a horrific sight. A horrific sight. And you know that this rich man was aware that he was there. I mean, he couldn't have helped it. Anytime he went from his estate to go into town or come back to his estate, there he was right at his, right at his gate. He's laying there, dogs all around him. He's thin, he's starving to death, bones exposed. His hands stretched out for anything, dogs all around licking the wounds, the man's begging for food, anything. And yet it seems that the rich man didn't pay any attention to him at all. And that would have fit right into the, into the Pharisees' theology as well. You remember back in chapter 15, Jesus was welcoming sinners and they were grumbling at him because of it. They would have considered a poor, unhealthy man like this with dogs all around him, someone who had sinned greatly and was cursed 
by God. And if they got close, they would have been defiled. So in the Pharisees' eyes, at this point of the story, they're thinking we've got which one rich man that certainly shows that he has God's favor upon them, upon them, deserving of God's favor. And then we have this poor man who obviously is cursed of God. Well, verse 22 says, now the poor man died. To the Pharisees, that probably would have been good riddance. But it also says a rich man also died and was buried. It's interesting that the, Jesus doesn't give the rich man a name in this story. He gives the poor man the name Lazarus, and he doesn't mention that the poor man had a funeral, but he does mention that the rich man had a funeral. We don't know what happened to the poor man's body. Maybe the dogs won and drug it off. Maybe it was thrown into the city dump. We don't know. What we know is that he wasn't cared for or honored in this life or his death by the rich man. That's what we know. But Jesus does say the rich man was buried. He was honored even in his death. It would be easy to assume that there was quite a, quite a funeral for this guy. All the pomp, all the circumstance, all the trim. Surely the most stunning, expensive linens used as a shroud over this man. All the trim. Purple flowers, probably everyone dressed in purple. A massive, beautiful procession leading out to the most beautiful tomb having been probably carved by choice artisans over the years and years, and, and they would have laid him there. Now that's the, the here and now of the story. That's the life that they both had in this earthly life, this life that James calls but a vapor. One is massively wealthy, enjoying life every day, He's even honored in his death, the other poor, suffering every day from hunger, sickness, dying at a rich man's gate, and who knows what happened to his body. But for both, it's suddenly over. So we shift from the here and now to the hereafter. Now this is where the shock really would have hit the Pharisees. In fact, there, there, there's really two shock waves that come. First, Jesus says the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. They would have been scratching their heads when they heard that, kind of looking at each other going, well, what did he just say? I mean, that doesn't fit into their theology at all. They would have expected him to be in hell. It was obvious to them that he had the curse of God upon him. He was poor. He was sick. That meant he was a sinner. God wouldn't let some righteous person be poor and sick, would he? I mean, how could he go to heaven? That would have shocked them. But the second, probably greater shock, is that the rich man also died and was buried. Here it is. And verse 23 says, in Hades. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. The poor man isn't poor anymore. He's in heaven. The rich man isn't rich anymore. He's in hell. Jesus says the poor man was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. This whole thing is flip-flopped. That phrase is simply telling us that when he died, God gathered him into heaven. That's what being in Abraham's bosom meant. This, was, this is the only place that phrase is really used in Scripture, but if anyone in, was in heaven, it, it was who? Abraham, right? I mean, Abraham. He, he was the father of the Jews. He was the father of those who would come to God by faith. In fact, James 2.23, quoting Genesis 15.6 and also 2 Chronicles 27, were, were told that, that Abraham was a friend of God. So to be carried by angels into Abraham's bosom means that when this poor man died, he was escorted into heaven to the very fellowship with God and with Abraham. He's in fellowship with the father of faith, the greatest of Old Testament heroes. He's in fellowship with the, the one the Jews considered the greatest of all. I mean, you talk about being honored. 
He went from the lowest place in this life to the highest place in, in glory. And he wasn't at the end, he wasn't at the end of some long line waiting to, to get up and meet Abraham. I mean, it, Jesus portrays this poor man here as personally being welcomed by Abraham, personally comforted by Abraham, and enjoying fellowship with Abraham himself. For the Jew, it would have been the, the, the absolute highest place of honor. He's leaning on Abraham. He's, he's his honored guest. He's feasting with him. Well, we have that picture of John the Apostle in, in, in John 13 at the Lord's table. Remember when he was leaning? It says he was leaning on the Lord's breast, this intimate fellowship that's going on while they're eating together and enjoying this fellowship. And the Pharisees had to be wondering, how did this pathetic beggar, how did this person who is cursed of God, how did this decrepit invalid, this cursed sinner, get that privilege? How did he become the honored guest of Abraham? I mean, that was completely foreign to their understanding of God and to their understanding of salvation. But even a greater shock was that the rich man wasn't there. The rich man wasn't there. He isn't rich anymore. He's in Hades. Jesus says in Hades, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. This term Hades is found in the New Testament in Matthew and, and Mark and Luke and Acts and Revelation. The idea is also seen in 1 Peter as well. But And everywhere we find it, it's never used as a destiny for the believer. It's always used in the context of the person going there being the unrepentant, being the unbeliever. It's a place of torment for the unrepentant. It's, it, it's an underground prison where the pains of hell are being experienced. Those there will ultimately be judged at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20 and all of Hades cast into the lake of fire. But those who reject Christ, even in the here and now, when they die, they will immediately be in Hades being in torment. There isn't any soul sleep. There isn't any purgatory. They're immediately sent to Hades. And here is this rich man in Hades. He lifted up his eyes, it says, being in torment. It's a place of torture. Basanios in the Greek, literally tortures, it's plural. It's plural, various tortures, various torments coming from all around him from every direction, non-ending torments. Some of those may have been reminders of the times that he rejected the gospel. The times where he didn't pay attention to God. The times when he had an opportunity to repent but didn't. Because he wasn't interested. Because he had more fun things to do. Because he was captivated by the world around him. Because he was enjoying sin. Because he was impressed with himself rather than paying attention to God. Instead of repentance, he pursued pleasure. And now here he is. The, the guilt, the, the lost opportunities haunting him. Remember, Jesus described this place for us in Luke 13, 28, where, where he, he describes it as a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a horrific place. Opportunities to pursue God, to repent, to listen to His Word and believe on Christ are gone. Those opportunities were wasted in order to indulge the flesh instead in this life. And now the sinner is living in an eternity of torment. Jesus says it's a place filled with darkness in, Ma in, in, in Matthew 8 and Matthew 22 and 25. It's a place where the evil spirits are kept in everlasting chains under darkness in Jude 6 and 13. And yet a place of everlasting fire at the same time filled with terrors, crushing guilt, painful regret, utter loneliness in a place from which there is absolutely no return. It's from there. This guy lifts his eyes as if to look for some relief, any relief. And so the story moves to focus on a conversation where this rich man who is no longer rich is crying out to Abraham to please hear him. 
This is the cry of the tormented. Again, this is, this is a story, although hell is very, very real, people in hell aren't going to be talking to people in heaven. But the story is formed in this way, again, to communicate something to the Pharisees who were listening. So Jesus creates this conversation between this man in hell and Abraham. The tormented man first asked for relief. Verse 24, and he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. I find it fascinating that he's asking Abraham for Lazarus to serve him here. As if Lazarus is his slave. As if he's still the master. The guy hasn't changed at all, has he? The gall of this guy to ask favor from the very person that he showed no mercy to and let die at his gate. Now he's wanting Lazarus to serve him. Abraham was this tormented man's father, he says his father. He, Abraham was his father only in a genetic sense, but he, but he didn't have the faith of Abraham. A faith that trusted God, a faith that demonstrated his love for God and love for others. So this guy hasn't changed at all. But understand, hell, hell does not exist to change people. It exists to punish people. Hell confirms them in their sinful state and becomes the penalty they deserve. The eternal penalty that they deserve. So here he is asking for others to serve him. Send Lazarus so that he may dip his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. The suffering, the torment of hell is so great, even one drop of water on the tongue would be considered a monumental relief. He's in agony. Literally, he's undergoing physical torment. Give me some relief. But it's not going to come. It's not going to come. And Abraham gives two reasons why. First, he says, child, verse 25, child, remember that during your life you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus received bad things. But now... He is being comforted here, and you are in agony. I think it's interesting that he calls him child here. I think Jesus just used that word in Abraham's conversation here in, in this answer in order to show his compassion for the Pharisees. He's using this story, remember, to turn the Pharisees from their sin, to call them to repentance, to get them to wake up and realize there is an eternity that is before them. And if they don't repent, if they don't forsake their love for money, if they don't turn, turn to God, trusting Him for the forgiveness of their sin and eternal life, His warning here is that they will be there. child. There's tenderness in that. Remember that during your life you received your good things. The common grace of God was abundant. Abundant around this guy. All you enjoyed, all you were given, all the blessings that filled your life, all that was a gift from God. All the purple, all the linen, all the, the, the wealth and the joy, all that you enjoyed in life. It was a gift from God. I mean, James tells us that all good things come from God, right? The rain, the, the sun, a creation to enjoy, a family to enjoy, food to eat, productive work. We're, we're, we're given all these things to enjoy in order to, listen to this, in order to thank and praise God for His goodness. The stars at night, ocean waves, the mountains, the trees, the flowers, it's all a gift that we might acknowledge Him, that we might praise Him, that we might thank Him. That's the common grace. But this guy doesn't. He just indulges himself in it all. He lost himself in it all. 
enjoyed it with no thanks, with no praise to God, with no care about thanking God at all, just selfish indulgence. On the other hand, it says the likewise Lazarus received bad things. He received bad things. Notice that they weren't bad things that he brought on himself. He received bad things. But difficulties in life from the hand of God, sufferings, pains. But in those things, he turned to the Lord for his help. That's why Jesus gave this character in the story the name Lazarus. God has helped. God has helped. The one who enjoyed all the good things from God's hand wound up in hell because he was preoccupied with them and neglected God's salvation. The one who suffered difficult trials, a painful and hard life, was turned to God in his pain and wound up in heaven with God because he learned to trust God through all those difficulties. Abraham is saying, you had the opportunity to turn to God in the good things God gave you during your life, but you didn't. Just like Abraham had the opportunity to turn to God for help in the bad things God gave him, and he did. So now he is being comforted. And you are in our agony. So he's not getting any relief. First, because he neglected turning to God when God in His common grace had given him so many, many reasons to turn to Him. Second, it's because it's logistically impossible. Verse 26, And besides all of this, between us, you, uh, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that the one may cross over from there to us. In other words, those who go to hell will never have the opportunity to go to heaven. And in the same way, those who are in heaven will never go to hell. There's a permanent chasm that's fixed between the two that no one can cross. When you die, where you end up, is where you will be for all eternity. So the mercy asked for cannot be granted. When a person dies, their eternal place is irreversible. That's what suddenly dawns on this man who's there tormented in hell. So he has another request. Look at verse 27. And he said, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Now that sounds like there is a bit of compassion maybe in this guy. I don't know. He's concerned for at least someone else other than himself. He's concerned for his five brothers. He knows they're just like him. He knows they're consumed with riches. He knows they're lovers of money and they neglect God. He knows they love riches and are so preoccupied in enjoying them that they ignore God and others. He knows they believe the same corrupt theology. They think they're good people. They think they have God's favor because they're rich. And he knows that unless they turn, unless they repent, they just, they're just going to end up with him in hell. And so he wants to warn them, so he begs Abraham to send Lazarus to persuade them to repent. Maybe he's thinking, well, Lazarus must know the way to heaven since he's there. My brothers don't because they believe what I believe and I'm here. He's probably thinking they, they go to synagogue just like I did. They were raised in a Jewish home just like I was. We were all religious family. We did all the stuff you're supposed to do. And here I am in hell. So send Lazarus to explain to them why people go to hell and how they get to heaven. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now there's the key. They had the scriptures. Their problem was they weren't listening to them. Remember, this is about the Pharisees. 
they had Moses and the prophets. Remember in verse 16, and the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. They were the ones who studied the law and the prophets. They had the law and the prophets. They had all they needed to know God's way of salvation. They had Moses and the prophets. That's referring to the Old Testament. They had all they needed to learn about God, but rather than coming to the Scriptures to know God, to understand His way of salvation, they were using them. They were twisting them. They, they used them. They used their religion to become rich. But they had all they needed in Moses and the prophets for salvation. They, they could have just read and believed that God is the creator who is holy and just. They had the, they had the Ten Commandments right there in Exodus, Exodus 20 to examine themselves, to understand that they were not like God, that they are sinners before a holy God in need of repentance under a, the judgment, under the condemnation of a just and holy God. They had the whole sacrificial system spelled out for them in great detail, teaching them that God deals with sin by means of a substitute. They had the scriptures that taught that God was going to send a seed to destroy Satan's work, a seed of David who would not only be a substitute for their sin, but the Savior who would also be the conquering king to fulfill all the promises God made to Abraham. They had all they needed to understand repentance and faith in God, trust in God and His Messiah. They had all they needed to understand they were going to have to deny themselves and follow Him. They were going to have to give their lives to Him, surrender completely to Him. Their problem is that they were preoccupied with self. They were preoccupied with riches. They were preoccupied with money. They were preoccupied with pleasures. They were preoccupied with entertainment. They were listening they weren't listening to Moses and the prophets. They weren't interested in dying to self and following Christ. But he's the only way of salvation, isn't he? That's all they needed to hear the word of God. That told of God, God's promises of salvation in the coming Messiah to turn from their sin and follow him. And it was... It was all there. It was all there in the scriptures. It was all there in the Moses and the prophets. Jesus even said in Luke 24, the law, the law of Moses and the prophets spoke of him. They, they, they have the law. They had Moses and the prophets. Abraham says, let them hear them. Well, that wasn't good enough for this guy. So he says in verse 30, and this is just like the Pharisees. He says in verse 30, but he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. In other words, send some ostentatious sign to them, then they'll believe. Send Lazarus, who they know died, send him back, and they'll believe when they see him alive. He's saying, Scripture isn't enough, Scripture isn't adequate, Scripture isn't sufficient. Put a show on for them. Send Lazarus back, someone from the dead. I mean, that'll cause them to, to consider their ways. That'll cause them to repent. I mean, the Pharisees were always, were always looking for something outside of Scripture to, to validate the Messiah. Scripture wasn't enough for them. In fact, in Mark 8, verses 11 through 12, Jesus says the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, argue with Jesus, seeking a sign seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, Jesus says, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. This rich man, think about this, this rich man is in hell. And the sign that he thought was from God, the sign that he thought told him that he had the favor of God was that he was wealthy, right? His riches. Instead, that was his curse because he loved the gift more than he did the giver. He trusted in the gift and not in the giver. He refused to listen to the path of salvation laid out in Moses and the prophets. And so Jesus says in this last phrase, kind of like, yeah, now, now, now I want you to listen to me. Please listen to me. Please hear me. This is the warning. If they do not listen to Moses 
and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And wasn't that true? If they wouldn't believe the Word of God, if they wouldn't take God's Word at face value, if they wouldn't treasure God's Word, if they wouldn't believe the Word of God, they weren't going to believe someone even if they were raised from the dead. These religious rulers, these Pharisees, were only interested in religion for their personal gain. They weren't interested in knowing God. They refused to see themselves as sinners in need of repentance. They were in it for the money. They were self-righteous. They were in it for what the money could do for them. They loved the money and not God. They formed a theology to fit their lust, and they would spend an eternity in hell if they didn't see it and repent, if they didn't confess themselves as sinners and turn to Christ for forgiveness. So with compassion, so with compassion, Jesus gives to his enemies this simple story and warns them that their love for self instead of God, their trust in other things instead of God, will ultimately put them in hell for all eternity. Later on, his, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus' real-life friend, Lazarus, the, the real-life friend, he dies, you remember? And in John chapter 11, Jesus goes to Bethany and raises him from the dead. Because of that, verse 47 there says, Therefore the chief priest and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are you doing? For this man is performing many signs. They should have believed, right? Jesus raised somebody from the dead. Verse 48 says, If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Verse 53 says, from that day on, they plan together to kill him. Jesus warns them with the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and they don't believe. He raises the real Lazarus from the dead. They don't believe. Then he himself is raised from the dead. And they don't believe. The warning is this, here is that if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Signs aren't going to save anyone. You get that? Glitter falling from the ceiling isn't going to save anyone. Healings aren't going to save anyone. Even raising dead people from the dead, it's not going to save anyone. The power of God unto salvation is found in the gospel. It's the word of God concerning the Christ of God that the spirit of God uses to give spiritual life to those who are spiritually dead. So we need to be those in an age where people are into the wealth that the Christian religion offers so many we need to be wise in the age in which we live. We need to be those who are faithful, not to chase after signs and wonders, but those who are faithful to be in the Word of God and to share it with others, to share the gospel with others. Whether they're atheists, whether they're agnostics, but also remembering there are many, many, many religious people who haven't acknowledged themselves as sinners before a holy God in, are in need of His mercy. We need to explain the gospel to them that as they place their faith in Christ alone, that they can be saved from their sin and have the hope of eternal life. Scripture teaches salvation by faith in Christ alone. God the Father made Him, God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 
if there's anyone here that realizes maybe that you're one who's been playing a game and just coming to church, just putting on the show, and yet in your heart there is not a love for God. You've never seen yourself or confessed yourself as a sinner before God in need of His mercy, and you haven't cried out to Him. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. His arms are open wide. Repent from your sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who paid that penalty for you, and come to him. There's salvation in him alone. Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us in this short little story of the frightful expectation of hell for those who play the religious game but aren't coming to you poor in spirit, humbly, beating on their breasts, crying out to you that they might be acknowledging to you that they are a sinner and crying out for salvation. I pray that if there's anyone here that is in that place that your spirit might guide them to our Savior today. I also pray for the rest of us, Lord, that we might take this and just the reminder of the imminency of heaven and hell, that this life is but a vapor, it's short, and in a moment it will all be over and we will be at a place, one or the other, with no recourse to ever leave or find any relief for all eternity. We pray that you will burden our hearts with that as we go around and interact with, with people in the world, whether it be workplaces or at stores or wherever, that we would realize these are eternal souls and that our hearts might be burdened to share the truth of Jesus Christ with them. That they too might have the faith of Abraham and be rejoicing with him for all eternity. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.